Hello, I'm Anna Raimondi, coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. Today, our guest is Tasha Silva. Tasha graduated from Yale with a degree in English literature, but a long way fell madly in love with yoga philosophy. For the past 30 years, she has taught people around the world ways to align with inner love. She is the author of Outrageous Openness, one of my favorite books, mm -hmm. Change Me Prayers and It's Not Your Money. She lives near San Francisco where she runs an online forum which engages these ideas called Living Outrageous Openness. Thank you so much for coming on today. I'm you. so happy to be talking with you. I do truly love Outrageous Openness. I recommend it to everybody. It's such a great book. And if any of you out there have not read it, um, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Thank so, you so much. You're welcome. I'm very happy to be here with you. Yeah. So, you know, with outrageous openness, I found myself, you know, reading a chapter a day and meditating on it. So the chapters are small, which I also like. Um, so like you don't waste words. Um, you know, you're funny, you're playful, and yet you're to the point. So the, the message kind of seeps in, which is really pretty wonderful. Um, what inspired you to write that book? You know, um, I had had a writer's block for about 30 years after college, and I just couldn't write. And then somewhere around, oh, 2009 or 2010, I got an opportunity to start writing a column online. And it was the perfect way to sort of trick me into writing because there would be these deadlines and I'd have to like just mash something out and it got rid of the writer's block. And eventually just the columns started getting a lot of attention from people and they were talking about spiritually where it was taking them in a really practical way. And also the fact that it was funny and it wasn't lecturing people, but it was more meeting them where they were and really showing them how to let the divine take the lead. Well, I think that is conveyed completely in outrageous openness. You know, it's kind of like, follow me where I go and laugh along the way because it's okay to have a sense of humor. Yeah, not only okay, but sort of essential. And uh, I think I heard somebody say once that you should never trust someone who calls himself spiritual, but is very somber all the time, because mm -hmm. God actually has a great sense of humor. Yeah, I so, agree with that. yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, you talk about the force of love. Um, like, what is that? And how can we all let it lead the way? What is the force of love? What's that all about? I mean, I don't think it's that complicated. I think everybody, whether they call themselves a spiritual person or not, has had some experience of love, even if it's just having a cat in their lap, as I have right now while I'm talking with you. I mean, people, some people have felt it gardening. Some people have felt it watching a movie they love. So I think you tap into what creates that spark inside of your heart sometimes it can be very independent of people you know someone will say well everyone i've loved has let me down it doesn't matter usually when you dig a little you find that spark in somebody and to me you build a relationship to that spark of love and you start to realize over time that that's actually what you're composed of at your essence that it's not something out there it's actually alive on the inside so when, you know, we hear we're, we're made in the image of God, do you think the image of God is really the love? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I do. Yeah, um, because like, you know, to me, God is the highest vibration of love. God is, love. Yeah. you know, love is indescribable because it's divine. Yeah. You know? um, so it's important, I think, that people kind of understand that because it's such a beautiful feeling and way of looking at the world. It changes our perceptions of things. You know, especially when it comes to surrendering. Um, so divine surrendering, um, you talk about that. Um, what does that what does that mean to you? Well, I get into it a lot more in the books that follow outrageous openness, and especially in the most recent book, and it's not your money, because to me, people talk a lot about surrender 
like an idea, like they say, oh, you should surrender, you should let go. But I actually don't hear it spoken about very often in terms of how the hell do you do that? And not just that it's a nice idea. And so what I started to write about more in the subsequent books was there's an action called offering, which is really where you're taking the um, attachments to, you know, I need things to go this way, or I want this thing, or I want that thing, or why can't I have this or that? You begin to take those attachments and you begin to actually offer them, whether it's through a uh, ceremony or if, if it's just through an internal prayer you begin to offer those things to the great self as opposed to thinking about them as belonging to the ego. And it's a practice like going to the gym. It takes time, it takes energy mm -hmm. with things that someone has a ferocious attachment to. It can really take practice to get to the point that you're not faking it, you know, mm -hmm. because somebody can say, oh no, no, I've surrendered that. But when you poke a little bit, you go, wow, no, actually it really, belong still to the small self and that's okay that's the process that we're all in but to me that's how the surrender experience begins to unfold once you want to work with it I think 2020 in a certain way was like a mass surrender mm -hmm. on the planet and people that had some openness to learning how to move with that flow it helped a lot if you were somebody that said I want my wish list and I don't want to don't want to play unless I can get my wish list. 2020 was really hard. Yeah, you know, um, it's all about, well, it's about control, you know, the ego exactly. control. I can do this on my own. I don't need, exactly. you know, I exactly. try to live um, in surrender. I surrender myself. I surrender my family. Um, and it, it took many years, yes. many years of really saying, I'm not going to get anxious about the lack of control, you know, because right. it brings an anxiety, like, how can I give it up when I, I, I need to control this, you know, I've been taught right. to control this, That's you it. know, and when I tell people, and I try to, you know, show people how to do this, you know, you give it up with one hand, and you take it back with another, and you can't take it back. And well, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. You, know, you can, you can co-create Okay, but it doesn't mean that you need to be in control of every single thing in your life either. Yeah, you know, what I think is interesting with this is that the, the act of, to me, there's three levels of surrender, and there's a level of surrender where it's a mental idea. And then there's this level of surrender where you're really starting to say, dear God, it, it really involves prayer, at mm -hmm. least for someone like me, so that it's not an abstraction. It sounds good. But when you're really doing it for me, I've often, with the really painful stuff, I had some health issues uh, a couple years ago. I was on the floor, dear God, take over, bring the right mm -hmm. help, open the way, or let me accept this 100% as it is. Mm -hmm. Get me out of the way because I really do think that the ego of its own volition doesn't have any interest in surrendering. Mm -hmm. So when somebody says, oh, you grab it back with the other hand, of course, because that's the, nat the nature of the ego and there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with it. It's doing its job, but it doesn't really have any interest in the surrender. So I think it really takes another aspect of the self to take over and it can be invited. Yeah, well, because the ego is a protection mechanism. Exactly. You know, and yeah. it wants you to protect from the woo-woo. Exactly. Um, that's what or from, from what undercuts its power, right? That's right. So, um, yeah. Because we all, you know, part of our nature is to stand in our power. And sometimes it's good. And sometimes it's not so good, you know? And yeah, it's, it's hard to discern sometimes, you know, what is good and what's not good, especially if you're coming from an ego base. Yeah, and I think even that issue about so-called personal power, I never think of uh, what I'm writing about as being self-empowerment. I never think about it as self-help. I never think about it as self-improvement. I actually think about it as God takes the hell over, <laughs> like God really takes over, and the process can be very um animating and even frightening at first 
and very liberating when you realize you never actually had the power in the first place. There were the things that were meant to happen were going to happen. Right. I mean, I think it's completely liberating. It's so much. I've been in the other place. Yes. In the place I'm in now. And this is so much better. Is, yes. uh, so much better. But then there's the question of how much is destiny and how much is fate? Right. You know, um, do you have anything to say about that? I would say I mostly don't worry about it because once that passage happened, like there was some turning point that became, I, this might sound silly to say it, but I think from how you sound, you'll understand. There was some point at which it stopped being my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I ended up writing a book called It's Not Your Money because the my starts to melt away. And it doesn't mean there's not a personality here who has all of her quirks and eccentricities, but the my isn't in control anymore. And so at that point, I don't actually care what's destiny and what isn't. I'm just there following the flow, saying, guide me, use mm -hmm. me, use me for the highest. Let whatever you gave me this life be of the greatest service. The rest of it to me is almost like a mental game. You know, I mean, my, you might know from the book, I have a background as an astrologer, and I would say charts show it's like there's a mix of destiny and free will if you look at them a certain way. But again, I care more about just offering it over and seeing what's wanted in the moment. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And that's how I live my life. Otherwise, it's too complicated. So complicated. You could drive yourself crazy with that just, question. Yeah, and it just hurts your head. You know, Absolutely. You know, when I was writing com uh, conversations with Mary, and to those you've listened, you've heard me say this before, she repeats over and over again, keep it simple. Yes, exactly. Because we complicate everything. And then we go into exactly. this place of over processing and try to figure it out. And you know what? We really can't figure it all out. Right. You know, if you trust and you have faith and you give it up to God, you go with the flow, you know, and that's, that's probably more important than anything else is to kind of live in that place where you become an arm of the divine on right. your journey. You know? Yeah. And the, and the same thing with prayer. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like I, I look at I look at every day as a prayer. Like what I do during the day is my prayer. You right. know, how I conduct myself, how I help other people, you know, how I raise my vibration through them and raise their vibration. And it's not Anna Raimondi, you know, it's God, it's divinity right. that I right. allow to move through me. So when people pray, they can say the prayers of their religion, or I just talk to God, mm -hmm. like, okay, God, here's the story. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what to do with it. And I'm just giving it up to you. And whatever happens happens yeah it's, it's for my highest good right so i think that's um i think that's important um what's the you talked about the small self before what's the difference between the small self and the great self oh i think that i'm just interchanging words i think of the small self as being the ego mind basically so a lot of times when somebody says I'm just this way, I'm always anxious, or I'm always grasping, or I'm always jealous. They're just describing a small part of their whole being, which is the kind of acculturated ego mind. And then there's the great self, which to me, I don't even think of it as one part is bad, one part is good. It's just different aspects of the being, the great self connected to love, connected to the witnessing capacity. So would you consider the great self your soul? Yeah. And the, the, the inner divine. And I think one thing that's interesting is that, uh, you know, in the forum that I have online, um, we do a lot of work with the inner child. Because a lot of times when people are saying things that are really overwhelming them or whatever, they're actually talking about the inner child, which to me is an aspect of that small self. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the part inside that needs the comforting, that is scared mm -hmm. and all of that. And then, so what I've you know, been working with with people for a long time now is how to let the personality be anchored in the one who's caretaking for the inner child who's so freaked out. 
because that's like the small I or the small self that it actually sometimes even is a very childlike energy. Whereas when you start to step into the inner caretaker, you start to resonate more with the inner divine. And then when you do that, you become more nurturing to other people as well as yes. yourself. Yes. Um, and thus you become more compassionate. And then, yes. And then we can change the world. Well, you treat the world the way you treat yourself. Right. You know, yeah. and people can learn from you and, and you get it back too. You know, it's not just about you giving, you can receive. And a lot of people have a problem receiving. Yeah, that's a big part of the money book actually is uh, opening to receiving because I would agree with you. There's people that say, I've been trying to have this happen or that happen forever. And then when you start to really talk with them, they'll be like, I don't feel I deserve to receive. So that's a huge part of what that book is actually about. Well, it's about also you're putting out a negative intention. You know, um, I don't feel like I can receive. I don't feel like I'm worthy to receive. I don't feel like I'll ever receive. So you're putting that out to the universe and words carry energy. So it's completely counterproductive. Hmm. So um, it's not your money. So whose money is it? <laughs> the divine. So yeah. are you talking about real money in the book? Like, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I'm a really... I'm a Capricorn. I'm a really practical person. And I always think there are, you know, ways that people are more embarrassed about money than they are about sex or any number of other things. And so to me, if it all belongs to God, why not talk about money too? But I think one of the interesting things that happens with that book is that people have been writing me and saying, you know, I applied it to money, but I also realized it's not my relationship and it's not my house and it's not my job. And so it starts to get people in the consciousness of how to genuinely offer as opposed to living from that place of my, because sometimes even, you know, to use the example of co-creating, you get people, they say they're co-creating with God, but when you really start to talk with them about it, they see it as my, it's all mine. I'm grasping on. So to not to say that there's anything wrong with that, but to move it into that place where the my starts to dissolve really allows the surrender to happen. So. And have you seen that um, in relations to the book, you know, people who have read it and follow it move into that abundance with money? Yeah. And well, again, one of the things with that book is, um, not seeing abundance as something to attract, but seeing it as something to be. And so it has all these prayers and all of these steps to dissolve the current identity as somebody who is in the way of the flow and open to the idea that you and I have been just talking about of being uh, willing to be used for the flow, both to give and receive. So to me, the idea with divine source, which is one of the big pieces of the book is that no person, place, or thing is your source. Not a partner, not a trust account, not a mm -hmm. job, none of it. And if that's happening, then you're basically coming from that place of saying, all of my needs will always be met, period, the end. So to me, even from the place of karma, I, don't, I didn't write the book to say everybody needs to be a millionaire including myself. Not that there's anything wrong with that, mm -hmm. but I don't think that's the goal of the book. I don't think it's about manifesting anything, to be honest. To me, it's about actually when that level of offering completely takes over and the mind dissolves and you're finally saying, let divine source take over. Let me give and receive with complete abundance. Then everything that's needed comes. And for some people, day to day, they're in that flow and they don't even know a month later where the flow is going to take them. So, so you get a lot of people saying, I work 13 hours a day. I work. So isn't this my money? I earned it. Sure. I do get people saying that. And I, I don't argue with people. See, this is the thing. To me, it's a paradox 
on the human level, of course, it's your money. On a deeper level, if you got hit by a car today, you think that's going to go with you to the next realm? I mean, you're the expert on mm -hmm. the next realm. So how could it be yours, mm -hmm. right? So to me, so many spiritual things are holding that paradox. So I don't really spend any time arguing with people who say that. I just say yes in the current identity of thinking that you are this envelope of skin. Of course, it's yours and you can grip onto it with all of your might. But is it bringing you happiness? Because mm -hmm. once you begin to open the grasping hand and just invite the divine in to actually release the my, that's something extraordinary happens with the money. I get letters every week where people say, I worked so hard for money until I began to use this book. And then it's coming from places that I never could have dreamt of because you're no longer saying where it has to come from. And the person is comfortable receiving for the first time. Yeah. So I think that's a big thing with spiritual people. Like people will say to me, well, money doesn't matter. Like, you know, um, especially if you're raised, you know, in some religions, yes. that money is evil. Yes. You know, um, money isn't evil. You know, it's okay to make money. It's just not okay to make it your God. Right. You know, it's not the end all, you right. know, and there's nothing wrong with if you can afford to have nice things, have a party, you know, um, but it can't be your focus of living. That's well, I proper. think what I really agree with you. And, you know, one of the things in that book is there's a goddess of wealth, Lakshmi from India. Mm -hmm. And I love her. I mean, she's the goddess of beauty and love and money. And it's all together. And the thing with her is she rules gratitude. So a lot of this is about you invoke Lakshmi, not by asking for what you want next, but by being grateful for what you already have. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to me, it's all just opening to letting the flow use you and money is just one more thing. Yeah, that's a great way to, um, to put it, you know, letting the flow use you and kind of going along with it, not fighting it, you know, because people will fight it. They'll go against the wave, you know, and it's like, you're going to wind up on your back, you know, so if doors, you know, I always tell people, you know, the door opens, you got to walk through it um, because if you don't, you know, you might be yeah. missing out on a huge opportunity, yeah. you know, kind of say, this is where I'm being pulled. You have to feel it. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of nice. Um, who was your mentor? Like, who did, like, who do you look to as like leaving out God, um, like a human being, um, oh. like a mentor? Like, did you, do you follow someone, somebody influence you along the way? You know, I think there's been so many people along the way from so many diverse, I can't even name one person. It's like I've followed, oh, there's different spiritual writers that really have influenced me one way or another, you know, like Ajashanti, who is a, a non-dual teacher. And there's a woman, Joan Tollefson, who's a non-dual teacher, but there were also just yoga teachers over the years. I've, you know, been practicing vinyasa yoga. It's, it's kind of funny. For me, I have the passage that I went through, as much as I've gotten inspiration from many, many places, it had to come from finally just being with myself. Because the things that I wanted to write about, I actually wasn't reading. I can't say that I read something and it said, oh, I want to copy that. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I actually wrote the books I wrote because I had so many questions about how do you actually surrender? Why isn't anybody mm -hmm. telling me how to do this? How do you actually let God take over? Mm -hmm. I wasn't finding it places. So, you know, it's a lot of it's been trial and error. Yeah. And, you know, I'm from the same place because if you had to ask me who a mentor was, I don't really have any, you know, I mean, it came from from me it came from a higher source 
you know, I just kind of let it move through me. And if everybody would, I mean, yeah, read the books, of course, they bring you to the altar. But once you get to that altar, you got to do something on your own, you know, and let it kind of move through you, which that's where the beauty comes in, don't you think, is that connection with ourselves and with divinity. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's honestly different for everybody. And I think that people are in different stages with, with where they find inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, I just know I, I had to get answers that I couldn't find anywhere else. So I had to just mm -hmm. sit there and drive myself crazy until I could start to get answers that made sense. Well, thank you, because your books are amazing. Um, what, is the, what is the most important first step that people need to take to redefine their relationship with money? With money, I would say, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm candid about this in the book because I grew up with so much fear around the topic. And I think a lot of people do. So for me, the it was probably a prayer that said, I'm ready. I am ready. Show me how to let you begin to guide me on this topic. Because I was letting the divine take over my relationship. I was letting the divine take over my health and money was the last in line. It was like, I was so scared of really letting go, you know, who knows if it's from past lives or what, mm -hmm. but I think everybody has their topic where they're like, yes, God, you can take over everything, but not that. Mm -hmm. So that's why when you say to me, when, you know, you say someone says, but it's mine. I can't fault them. I don't pretend to be in some state where that feels very familiar 10 years ago. That was completely where I was at. So you start where you are, but I think that invitation to say, just show me the first step, God. You know, if you say I'm really suffering about money, show me the first step to begin to let your will take the lead on this topic that's all you need. Simple. Really that's simple. for starters. Yeah. I do agree with you when you said that that's in your book where she said, keep it simple. It's the truth. This gets so overcomplicated. Yeah. We overthink everything. We overprocess everything, but this is the simple stuff. You know, you just kind of, you just be, you know, nobody understands just being, you know, just be. You know, it's, it's not a concept that Americans understand. You know, we have to be thinking and figuring it out. And that gets in the way of accepting and, you know, and the flow, so to speak. So are you writing another book now? No. <laughs> I'm actually, what's that? But you will. I will. I will. I, I'm ready to uh, just let it gestate for a while. There's yeah. like, four, there's four books out now. It's, it's enough for a bit. So what are the names of all your books? Uh, let's see, there was Outrageous Openness. And then there was a book after that called Change Me Prayers. Oh, that's another great book. And I've read Change Me Prayers. That's a wonderful yeah. book. Thank you. And then there was another book called Make Me Your Own, which was um, poetry. And then there was an, the um, It's Not Your Money. So now I'm resting. I'm not really resting. I'm just doing other things, but it, so they'll be back. So tell us about your forum. How can people, can people sign up to be on it? Like, how can people get in touch? Yeah, if they go to um, my website, just atoshasilver.com, they'll see the first thing they'll get on the homepage is the Living Outrageous Openness Forum. And, you know, we basically set it up because people got initially the first book and then Change Me Prayers. And they started writing in and they were like, I love these books but there's a big difference between reading the book, talking about it and actually mm -hmm. living it. There's mm -hmm. huge difference and I need help, you know, show me, like, give me the tools for how to really live this. So we set it up. It's been going for seven years now and there's just people from all over the world in it. And um, it really works. We do weekly calls. We, there's a lot of support and you get these great stories about how, people's lives are changing and just like you're saying the, the people will often say when I'm just out in the world holding this state 
takes practice because mm -hmm. I'm not seeing it on TV. I'm not seeing it standing in line at Walgreens. You know, I'm having to learn to hold it inside myself, regardless of what I'm surrounded by. And then they start to learn that. So it's not easy to walk the walk, you know, in the beginning, it's, it takes a lot of self-discipline and, and, and tra like training yourself, you know, to keep external over there and, and hold on to what's inside of you. And I also think it, you know, a, a really good sense of humor helps yeah. and not taking it real seriously mm -hmm. and not taking it like, oh, it's going to be, you know, so arduous. It, it is what it is. I think what mm -hmm. happens in a certain life, the karma, mm -hmm. it, I, I often joke about this when people find my books, they'll often say, I wouldn't have even been interested in this two years ago. I wouldn't even pick this book up a year ago. And yet when the moment came, I couldn't put it down because the soul wanted it. So I think everybody has their different timing. That's so funny because, you know, when people book appointments with me, I'm, you know, two, two and a half years out. And, you know, it's like, oh my God, like I'm going to book, like, I don't even know, like I'm going to, some people say, I don't know if I'm going to be living in two years. <laughs> and my attitude is, well, if you are, that's how you need to talk to me. <laughs> you know, there is, there's a divine plan for this. And I get that a lot. Like, yeah, someone will come to me, you know, and it's like, oh my God, like two years ago, I just thought, oh, I want to talk to this woman. And now I'm here with you. And it's like, I really want to, like, I really need you now more than I yeah. need you, or I really need to hear from my relatives or who ever now I need the guidance now so you know there is a rhyme and reason oh I really believe that I mean I've had people for some reason especially guys have written me and they're like oh my girlfriend or my boyfriend yeah. gave me this book two years ago I threw it in a closet mm -hmm. I had no interest in it and then all of a sudden I pulled it out two years later and I can't put it down because the souls move to a place that it's right. the right time it's so interesting to watch that that's a book. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you the write soul it. Is ready. <laughs> the soul is ready. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be a great book. You write it and I'll give you an endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I would write it if, um, if I had time to breathe. Um, but maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what I need to do. Well, thank you so much for being on. I love talking with you. You too. Um, I know that our paths will cross again. Um, thank you all who have listened to this episode today. If you loved it, please like, share, and comment on our YouTube pages or our, on the podcast page. And be sure to subscribe to our channels so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much, Tasha. Thank you.